I want to give you an intuition about how the calculation happens. It's a very complicated do file. If you're not a programmer, you could get lost in it. It's very long. It has a lot of loops. It has a lot of loops because it's actually trying to make the program shorter, right? Trying to optimize parts of the calculation that are repetitive, and that's why there are a lot of loops, but still it's quite complicated. So let's go over the theory first about the methodology so that you have um, sort of a conceptual understanding of what the DOFA is trying to do with the data, and then we'll get into the data and do it ourselves. So that's, that's the plan. So um, yesterday, we covered a lot of ground. We, we covered the first two chapters, basically half the course, right? And for the rest of the day today, we have two topics left. We have the construction, and then we have analysis and interpretation. So in the construction part, this is actually a new part that I've never presented myself before. This is, this is the part that is um, in, in the field of expertise of the index people. The Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OP, they were our partners in, in using this methodology to construct the index. So the methodology is based on the Alcar Foster method. So I'll, I'll give you a very sort of brief run through. It's going to be brief because we're going to just do it you know, in an hour or so. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll do it in state. Uh, the state of review, I'll do it just before we start the status stuff so that everything is fresh. Um, and, uh, and then after that, we will go on with the analysis. Hopefully, once you're able to run things and look at the data and play with it a little bit, then we will try to do this. Now, I don't know, given how much discussion happened yesterday, we're sort of playing it by ear. We, I, I hope we will have enough time to do extra group work because there is the, I gave you several sets of data. <laughs> One is the pilot release data sets from the original pilot. And I want to start with that because that's very clean data. It sh the, you know, the, da the do files are running, should be running perfectly. There are no errors. You should not have problems using it. And it includes the three pilot countries, Bangladesh, uh, Guatemala, Uganda. Um, hopefully, we can graduate from playing with that data because that data, it's the first pilot. Things have evolved. And there, there's a bigger data set called the Ghana baseline. Um, which uh, I have analyzed myself, and I've shared with you all the do files and some of the merged files that I've used. Hopefully, we can use that to do group work and use that as the basis for our analysis. Um, and then um, towards the end, I'll talk about how what we've done in analyzing uh, in analyzing the WEA and sort of to give you an idea of the types of analysis that that can be done using this information. Okay, and then we'll end with. A point here called communicating findings and recommendations, basically, you will do it yourself. So as part of the group work, you will be asked to, um, to make a presentation, a very short presentation. Hopefully, we have time for all that. It's a very packed curriculum, so hopefully, we won't, we won't stay too late. OK, questions so far? OK, so moving on. So the first part of the calculation section, the Alcar Foster method. So as I had mentioned yesterday, this methodology is really based out of poverty indices, where a lot of work on index creation and index methodology. There's a long history uh, in, in the poverty literature about this. So first, we'll start with unidimensional poverty measurement, just to sort of a brief overview to remind you how this is done. These are measures that you probably know very well. It's very commonly used. Um, we'll expand that idea to what happens if you wanted to do a multidimensional poverty measure. And this is where the Alcar Foster method comes in, because that's actually the, the method for multidimensional poverty measurement. And then once you understand this very well, then this one becomes very clear, because the way a methodology is really based on the multidimensional poverty. Um, so how many are familiar with what we're calling the foster greer Thorbeck poverty indices? Oh, some of you. Okay, great. Now, even if you don't know the names foster greer Thorbeck, you would know what's called the poverty head count. Everybody knows this, right? Poverty. So can somebody tell me what a poverty head count is? 
Yes. Oh, percentage of people below the poverty level. Very easy, right? So we call that a head count. And you'll notice that in the way a language, we use the word head count a lot. So that's part of the reason why it's, it's using that um, um, concept. Okay, so what are unit dimensional poverty measures? So when we say unit dimensional, it's one dimension. And when you look at the unit dimensional poverty measurements, we're really looking at income or as a proxy for income expenditures or consumption aggregate. But the idea is that it's one dimension because even if it's different areas of expenditure, you use a price vector and aggregate them into one dimension. So they're all in dollars, or they're all in uh, shillings, or it's all in one, one unit, you know, same unit. So you're able to transform it into single dimension. Now this, this is called achievement, right? This is the level. So the level of income, for example, is the level of achievement of this, what, uh, this dimension that we're using to measure poverty. So the achievements of a society or a country or whatever population of interest you have can be represented by a vector or a distribution. So basically, if this is our country, our little country in, in, uh, in the IFPRI office, each of us has an income, right? And it's all in the same unit, uh, say, let's, say, let's say dollars, standardized dollars, for example, right? And our, our achievements collectively can be represented by a distribution. So we just list each person's income. Um, the unit of analysis can be at the individual level or the household level. So at the household level, you get the household level income, or at the income level, uh, at the individual level, you can get each person's income. So if you have a labor force survey, you could have an individual level income. Um, if you're using a consumption aggregate, usually people, uh, it's, it's, it makes more sense in the, at the household level, but it's, it's standardized as a per, cap, in a cap, per capita basis. Okay. So the basic poverty measure, so this is, must, should be very familiar to you, what we're calling the headcount ratio. So this is the most commonly used measure of poverty. It is the proportion of the population that is poor. It ranges from zero to one, so it's a proportion. Uh, so in notation, if Q is the number of the poor in vector X, so vector is just the, the list, you know, our incomes you listed, listed in one line. Uh, with population size n, so there's n number of people here, then the head count, h, is just q over n, right? elementary. Okay, so for example, if z is our poverty line, so 10, income of $10, uh, and, and x, x is the income, is 9, 4, 15, and 8, how many people are poor? Three quarters, and the ones that are highlighted in red, but you can't, you can't see it very well, but the nine, the four, and the eight are below the poverty line, so they are counted as poor. And so three out of the four people, three-fourths are. Okay, very easy. Now, the next poverty measure, which builds on that first one, is the income gap ratio. So this reports the average normalized income shortfall of the poor from the poverty line. And this ranges between zero and one. So what's the difference between this and the headcount? The average normalized income shortfall of the i poor person is the poverty line minus their income. So that's the shortfall. And it's normalized. So as a share of the poverty line, right? So it's z minus the income over the, the, the poverty line. So the average income shortfall of all the poor, remember q are the only the poor people, so we're only averaging the ones for the, with a the shortfall. So it's the sum of all the poor people's shortfall, or it's z uh, poverty line minus the average income among the poor all over the poverty line. Right. So mu here is just the standard mean. It's the mean of the population. Okay. So example. So again, taking the example as before, where you have the four people with these incomes. What is the shortfall? 10 is a poverty line. The mean is just of the poor is just taking the mean of 9, 8, 4, and 8. So three people are poor. We take the average. That's 7. So it's 10 minus 7 over 10. It's 0.3. Okay? So the income gap ratio is 0.3. The head count was 3 over 4. 0.73. Mm -hmm. Okay? Everybody following so far. Okay, good. Um, now, 
Now there was a problem, what was the problem with this one? So in the head count, um, because you're only counting whether somebody's poor and somebody's not poor, what is the one criticism of this measure is that if you had a limited budget and you wanted to improve poverty, the policymaker has an incentive to only help the ones who are marginally poor, the ones who are closest to the line. They only need just a little bit of income to cross the 10. So you'd rather help the this person nine, with the nine, eight. you just give them one dollar and they're over the, or two dollars, they're over the poverty line. Whereas if you help this person four, they need seven dollars just to, right, to cross. So the incentives, for, if this is the what you're using for policy, you, if, you're tar, you can, if you use this for targeting, you're targeting just the marginal. Now, the income gap ratio um, is a little bit better because it's uh, tell, giving you the income gap. Um, so the, um, how did I put it, let me, so here if a person's, the problem here is that if a person's, poor person's income increases and they become non-poor, poverty increases, which is counterintuitive because if somebody's income increases then the poverty measure should improve, instead it will not because you're only counting the shortfall among the poor, you're not paying attention to that. To the non-poor, so if they, if they become non-poor, the average falls. So, so it's counterintuitive. So that's a problem. So instead, what we do is we use the poverty gap ratio. So this is sort of similar, but not quite. So this measure repairs that problem. Um, it reports the average normalized income shortfall from the poverty line using the censored distribution of that. So here we start introducing the language of censors, what, what censoring this distribution. So what does that mean? So the average normalized income shortfall of the i-th person is, uh, so we're calling it G. Okay, let me just, so it doesn't show my, so G, which is Z minus X, which is the censored, um, censored distribution all over X. And what Z that means, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, all over Z. So um, what that means is that instead of summing across only the poor people, mm -hmm. Q, you're summing across everyone. everyone. You're summing across everyone. And uh, what that means is that the, um, the, the people who are non-poor have a shortfall of, of zero, right? So you're, you're set, or not, not zero, but you're changing their income, you're censoring their income at the poverty line so that you can count everyone. Okay, so this is, um, do I have an example? Oh, there's something going on here. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, I had an example. Okay, so here's the example. So, as before, this is our uh, vector distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Poverty line is 10. So what does it mean to censor? So this person, this non-poor person with 15, mm -hmm. we would put, we would censor their income at 10 at the poverty line. So that they don't show a gap because they're non-poor. There's no shortfall. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't care how much over the poverty line they're at. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. We just care about whether they fall below. Right? So this person, we censor there. So that's what it means to censor, right? So, and then that way we can calculate the mean. So once you take the mean, apply the same formula, then it gives you a poverty gap ratio of this, which is slightly smaller than just the income gap. Income gap okay? um, and there are obviously, with the formula, there are other ways of, of doing it. So this is an alternative way to calculate that simpler which is just taking the mean of this and then applying the formula without having to sum up everyone's. Follow, everyone following so far? Yeah. Okay, so the poverty gap ratio ranges between 0 and 1. So when, when everybody is poor with no income at all, then it's equal to 1, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is poor, so this is, this is 0. Nobody, the average income in the population is 0. Then it's 1, 10 over 10. If there is no poor, everybody has a censored income, 10 minus 10, 0, right? Um, and the reason we like this better than the previous one is that if somebody's income rises, so let's say one person becomes non-poor, 
it will improve. Because if somebody becomes non-poor, you still include them in the, uh, uh, so let's say this person 9 becomes 10, you will have a right. Uh, and then it will uh, behave according to, uh, in, in, yeah, it would make sense. Then it will improve. Okay? Okay. And you can do that as an exercise on your, I, I didn't put it in here. So I, uh, but, but yeah, take my word for it. <laughs> okay. So I, there's another measure called the squared gap. I'm not going to go into it because we don't use it for the way. But it is in the same family of measures, right? You can go one step further and look at the squared gap, which gives you the depth. So this, so the head count gives you the incidence of poverty. The poverty gap ratio gives you the depth of poverty, gives you the shortfall, how far people are from the, from the poverty line. And then the squared gap gives you the intensity of poverty, the severity of poverty. So it would weight those further from the poverty line higher than those closer to the poverty line. But we're not going to go into that because we don't use it for the WEA. What we use for the WEA is the head count and the poverty gap ratio. Okay? So these class of indices we can summarize as um, what we call the foster Grill thorbeck measures. And it's summarized as this. So this, this summarizes the entire, uh, all, any, all of these measures. So when this parameter alpha and G star is the sensor distribution. So when alpha is, is zero, then it's the head count. When alpha is one, then it's the poverty gap ratio. And then if alpha is two, so it's the squared poverty gap. Okay? <coughs> so they're all sort of related. Okay, so unit, that's unidimensional for you, right? Uh, now, what happens, what, what happens when you want to measure multidimensional poverty? And, and the reason, the rationale for, for doing that is that you could argue that not everything can, has a price. Or if you're trying to measure, uh, or you're trying to measure dimensions that don't have markets, uh, and you don't trust, trust, you cannot find a price, or there is no market price, then they're not additive. You cannot add them. How can you, um, how can you, how can you quantify whether somebody is socially excluded? How do you quantify somebody's caste, for example? Or uh, how, do, can you put a price on that and say? Okay, even if you have this income, if you are part of this class, you are, you're actually considered poor, disadvantaged, but I cannot include that in a unidimensional measure. So there's a lot of arguments for broadening the dimensions of poverty measurement to include other dimensions that are hard to quantify and hard to add up. Okay, so that's the idea for this. So, so in the multidimensional poverty index that um, uh, OFI has developed, they look at three dimen uh, multiple dimensions representing the standard of living, which is generally what the current, po the unidimensional poverty measures. Level of knowledge, so this is like education levels, and then quality of health. So they have some indicator around <coughs> health or sanitation, that sort of thing. Um, and so you have three dimensions of achievements instead of just the one. And the problem is, how do you then augment or change those poverty indices that such that it would reflect all, all of these. Okay, so that's the that's the thing. So achievements of a society or a country can be represented by a main matrix or joint distribution. So instead of having just a vector, now each person has three data points. You have I have I know your your income level, standard of, I know your education level, and I know some aspect of your of your health characteristics, right? And every person. So instead of a Let's say if there are how many 15 people in this room, instead of a 1 by 15 vector, now we have 3 by 15. Okay, good. Um, everybody's following. Okay, and as before, the unit of analysis could still be at the individual level or at the house. Okay, so some uh, notations. So let's say matrix X is this distribution, right? So we have person I. Uh, so each entry uh, we de denote it by uh, ij, uh, x sub ij, and this is n number of people times d dimensions. And I, I will use uh, the term dimensions and domains interchangeably. That's, that's kind of what we mean by d. It's the number of columns. Uh, so this summarizes the joint distribution of the d attributes across n individuals. So each row vector, x, i, X i dot right denotes achievements of person i in all d dimensions. 
So this is like your data point, and your data your data point is if you're person one, right? Row, your row vector represents your standard of living for you, your education, your and and, and, and so on. Now the column vector denotes achievements of all the people in each persons in dimension D, right? So in the first dimension standard of living, then it's everybody's income level. If it's uh, education, it's everybody's uh, now years of schooling mm -hmm. and, and so on. So uh, vectors, and then we have that vector Z. It's not part of the matrix. Instead, this is the equivalent of a poverty line, right? This is the cutoff vector that denotes the poverty line of each dimension. So we have a poverty, before we only had a poverty line for standard of living. Mm -hmm. Now we determine a poverty, a cutoff of our poverty line for education. So at what level of education do we consider to be poor? So maybe we, the cutoff is uh, four years or, or, so, or maybe it's even a dummy, literate or not literate. If you're not literate, you're poor, right? Um, and same thing for health. This, do, do, we, do they need like a toilet, for example, for, for them to be non-poor or not, um, or, or some other measure? So, so you have an extra, extra information here for the, for the cutoffs. So he says the job of a measure or an index is to distill what is particularly relevant for our purpose and then to focus specifically on that. The central issues in devising an index relate to systematic assessment of importance. Measurement has to be integrated with evaluation. So at every, this is not an easy task. So what he means is that um, we, we are deciding, right, who is, you know, what is important. So for every aspect of it, right? So we're deciding what dimensions matter. We're deciding within each dimension, where should the level be? We, we were already talking about this yesterday. Is ownership of land enough to say that somebody is disempowered, right? So where should the cutoff be? So that's not an easy task. Okay. So what is the uh, so what's the challenge? So let's say so for them, what happened was um, a government would like say a government would like to create an official multidimensional poverty indicator, and they have there are some desirable properties of such an indicator. It should be understandable and easy to describe because otherwise how can you, you explain to government officials and vice versa, how can you explain to the people? It must conform to common sense notions of poverty. It needs to make sense. It needs to be intuitive. Um, it must be able to target the poor, track changes and guide policy. So it should be useful, right? Uh, it must be technically solid. So if somebody becomes non-poor, it has to behave accordingly. If if in this distribution people become uh, less poor, people's income fall, the, in, the index should reflect that. Um, it must be operationally viable. So it has to be easy enough to implement that people that they can do it on a periodic basis in good, with good quality. It must be replicable. Uh, so these are, if you're making an index, these are things that are nice to have, to make the index as useful as possible. Now, this is an exact analog to creating a disempowerment or an empowerment index. So this is kind of what happened, right? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we wanted to create a disempowerment multidimensional index. And you can switch empowerment, disempowerment. It's two sides of the, yeah. of the same coin. So instead of poverty, we're looking at disempowerment. That's what we're trying to measure. Um, our client was really USAID and Feed the Future. They were the ones who needed an, index, an indicator like this to monitor their programs. Uh, they would like to create an official multidimensional disempowerment indicator. And the desirable properties are the same. Right? So everywhere where we say poverty, we just swap it out with disempowerment. And this is a very nice kind of analog whenever you're lost with the methodology. And it's just remember, in terms of, and even in interpretation, just kind of remember the poverty analog, then it starts to make sense. Because what's confusing is that in the way, in the end, we actually flip it and call, talk about it in empowerment terms. Um, but the methodology is actually based on disempowerment. So when we're analyzing, we're always looking at disempowerment. We're set, you know, um, we're disaggregating among the disempowered. Uh, so we don't talk about the empowered, but the overall index is in terms of empowerment. So just sort of keep that in mind. Okay. Oh, sorry.
All right. So there are many steps uh, in, in, in creating the index. So one is the purpose, right? You need to be clear about what you want it for. Are you monitoring? Are you using it to target? Uh, or whatever other goal you have for the index? Because that determines there are trade-offs in the properties of the index. And you want to retain those that help you in your, in your, in your, with your purpose, right? So if you are trying to do uh, a cross-country comparable measure, like they were, it was quite important to make sure that everything was standardized and as applicable to as many contexts as possible. Uh, they, because of that, you sacrifice on the nuance and you sacrifice on the context specificity. Because if you were very context specific, then you cannot really compare across many. So there, there are trade-offs. And, and this making this clear can guide you in which, you know, which um, which features you want to fo you want to retain and which ones you can compromise on. Uh, the other thing is the unit of analysis. Um, are, will this be useful at the individual level, at the household level, or at the country or program level? Uh, the next really important decision is the dimensions. Which dimensions should be in an empowerment index or should be in a poverty index? Uh, if we're focusing on agriculture, what are those dimensions? So. In the way, uh, those dimensions were, were chosen by USAID. Um, so what they did actually was they looked at their programming and said, what are our interventions? Where do we expect our programs to have an impact? And let's make sure that the index that will measure our impact can capture those, those areas. So for example, there could be some uh, aspects, let's say, uh, I think, um, I don't know, mobility, whatever. People, you know, in some places, this is a very important aspect of empowerment. But they said, well, our programs actually cannot change, cannot change that, or they didn't think they were, they were doing enough to change that. They said, we, we're not, we're not focusing on that for, our, for the index, or it can, it doesn't need to be part of the specific index. We'll just measure that in another. Way. So they kind of define what the dimensions to be. The next decision is, well, what indicators are you going to use to? capture those dimensions. Do you need just one indicator? Do you need three? And you'll notice from the index that some dimensions have just the one indicator, some dimensions have two, some dimensions have three. Right? And which is the which are the best indicators? And and they use information from the pilot, from the first pilot, to guide the, those decisions, right? You ask you ask you know different questions on how to measure ownership of income and then you decide okay this was this was the best one so this is what we use. Okay. Uh, choice of poverty lines so this is cutoffs right so yesterday at the end of the day I don't know if you still remember everybody was uh, was out out of uh, was getting tired but um, each indicator has its own cutoff right so that has to be decided on. What cutoff makes sense? So, so you have to decide on the cutoff vector. You have to decide on the weights within dimensions. And in the way we ended up with equal the equal weights across the uh, the dimensions and equal weights within dimensions, right? And the reason for that is um, if you recognize each dimension as equally important, then it makes sense to have equal uh, weights. Now, if you have other reasons to think that one should be more important than the other, then that would mean you should weight whatever it is you think is more important heavier than the others. But there needs to be a very clear, very transparent rationale for that. It's not just because you want your data to look like it's high or it's low. Because you, you, know, you can manipulate the index using the weights to show whatever trend you want. But the, the goal here is to make the choice of the weights very transparent and um, yeah, and, and the rationale should be at clear. If it's not clear, then you know, in the absence of more information, you choose a uniform distribution, right? So in the absence of better knowledge about which should be weighted more, we just weight them all equal. Uh, so, so there are two aspects. So all of these sort of inform two very specific aspects of very important aspects of calculation. One is the identification method. Who will we consider poor? So all of this determine who ends up being empowered, who ends up being disempowered. And within and across dimensions, how do we then summarize the information for every person here so that we come up with a way? So that's what we call the aggregation method. 
Okay, so these are the two things we'll focus on for the, for the rest of this section. Okay, so again, poverty, 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 when we go to the way out, really, this is what happened. Instead of poverty lines, we call them inadequacy cutoffs. Instead of identifying who is poor, then we're identifying who is disempowered or who has, actually this is not correct, who has, who has, uh, no, no, this is correct, who is disempowered, disempowered. yeah. Um, and then, and then we, we try to summarize all of that across everyone. Okay, so key methodological points, so the, the methodology, so as if you can um, pin down identification and aggregation, and choice of space, which is which dimensions matter, then that's sort of the entire index. That's kind of all you need to do in index. So, um, actions, don't worry about that. Uh, ordinal data are common. So, here you could use, so in, in an index like this, it's okay to use ordinal data. So, even though you have, you don't need to have like, um, a variable like income, which has to be continuous, as long as you have information of what's better. So you, if you can rank the types of sanitation, let's say, uh, facilities that a household has, according from least desirable to most desirable, then you can figure out a way to, to, to decide on a cutoff and identify at which point will you consider it inadequate and at which point can you consider it adequate. Right? So ordinal data is okay. Um, and with, with this, you can actually decompose by subgroup. Uh, and after you've identified who is disempowered and not, then among the disempowered, we can disaggregate and decompose their achievements to understand where they are, uh, how far they are from the adequacy cutoff. How much how, how far below are their achievements compared to what you consider to be the minimum? Okay. So, just to review, unidimensional poverty, the variable is income. How does it identify? It uses a poverty line, right? Z. How does it aggregate? It uses the fourth degree Thorbeck measure. So, and we had that formula. So, for example, this is a different example now, just to make sure you're paying attention. Seven, three, four, eight. Poverty line is five. Okay. So what is head count? So let's call the we're we're calling it now a deprivation vector. So let's call that G zero. So non poor, 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 non poor. So zero, one, one, zero. What is the head count? It's just the mean of that. Two over four, one half, right? What is the normalized gap vector? That's G1. So, so the gap, right? The gap that's over the poverty line. So that would be zero, two fifths, one fifth, and, and zero. People following so far? Mm -hmm. Well, it's given as the poverty line. Yeah. It's not computed. Yeah, yeah, no, this is just, uh, right. The, the formula was in the previous slide. But uh, but basically, you you take the difference between the poverty line and this, right? So, well, normalized gap vector means for the non-poor, we censor. So the gap is zero. For there, there's a gap, two. The gap is two, and you divide it by the poverty line, so two-fifth. The gap is one over the poverty line, one-fifth. Non-poor, we censor. Okay? Poverty gap is just the mean of this, which is 3 over, yeah. So the challenge is, as I said, now what was the problem with the unidimensional measures? All components must be cardinally meaningful. They, the aggregate should reflect achievements and trade-offs. And the, actually, even though if that's not true, you're making an assumption when you're, you're using prices, right? You're making an assumption that, um, 10% more of my income that go that are you know um, if I'm using consumption expenditure if I'm spending this much on 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 education and this much on health um, it, it's the same as when when I spend everything all my income in a certain way and nothing on health for example because the the, the total is the same so there are a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, assumptions that are made so you also assume that all components can be merged. 
Um, okay, I'm not sure what this means. Empirical evidence for weight and functional forms. Uh, a shortfall in any component is of, not of concern. Okay, so this is, this is what I wanted to emphasize. So, so if there's something, so for example, if I have different sources of income, even if there's a, a shortfall in one aspect, if I can make up for it in another part of it, as long as the sum is the same, I have the same measure, right? I'm the same non-poor measure. Um, I, I should I should mention I should have mentioned in the beginning that this entire section is actually from that training course that Ofi runs. It's called the Ofi Summer School on Capability in Multidimensional Poverty. And when I first took this job in 2012, this was the first training course I had to do because I had to understand the methodology for the index. So these are from I was sitting like you, trying to understand what the index was, and this I took this from uh, Sabina's and 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 colleagues' um, a presentation. So these were the same examples how I learned how I learned the index. Of course, it will be shorter. That course is one no no two weeks three weeks. That those were two weeks. So so this will be a abbreviated version. Okay. So now to the the fun stuff, multidimensional data. Okay. So. The matrix of well-being indicator for n persons in d domains, and this is Sarah. This is what I was um, referring to when I said it might be clearer once you see a matrix. So let's call this matrix of achievements Y. And in the columns, we have the domains. And in the rows, we have the, the persons. So we have person 1, person 2, person 3, person 4. And we have four domains. So let's say this is, this is standard of living. This could be education. This could be... Uh, Health. health, and this could be, I don't know, something else. Quality of life. Yeah, some other measure of quality of life, right? So, so this is our matrix of well-being indicators. And then we have our cutoffs. So we have a cutoff Z. So in, in this example, we have 13, 12, 3, and 1. Okay, so those are, and immediately, you know, you can notice some are over, some are under, right? Okay, so how, how may, what happens next? Sorry, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're way ahead of us. Uh, we'll, we'll do it one step at a time. I know you're the best, but others have to catch up. Okay, so so just to give you an example of how the depriv deprivation cutoffs look like when you're looking at data, for example. So for schooling, this is the question you're using in your data. How many years of schooling have you completed? And then you can decide that six or more is counted as non-poor and then anything less than that is poor. And, and in this example, I've sort of highlighted in red what would be considered non-poor. This is kind of like what we did yesterday in the questionnaire, right? So we highlight the, the ones that, uh, that are adequate and, and, and show you in the codes which codes are counted as inadequate. So even though these are actually not additive, right? How much better is a pipe, is pipe water compared to say spring water? I don't know, but we just know it's better, right? So, I mean, we cannot quantify, right? We cannot quantify. So that's what we mean by this is ordinal data. So sanitation. Where do majority of household members go to the toilet? And we choose, let's say, own toilet. As long as they have an own toilet, that's non-poor. And if not, any other category is is poor. So this is an, just as an example. Of course, that we have four dimensions in our example. So going back, what we do is then we replace the entries, one if deprived and zero if not deprived, right? So we're, I did, we're doing sort of like the head count, but this time we're doing it in a matrix. So here I underlined all the entries that were under the cutoff. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see here. And we replace those entries with one if deprived, zero if not deprived. So that's what it looks like. So this is our G0. And this is what we call our matrix of deprivations. Okay. So normalized gap. So that was sort of like the headcount analog. So for the normalized gap, this is the, this is the uh, formula. So you, the shortfall over the cutoff, right, if deprived, and zero if not deprived. So, so here, see the rule is, in the gap if it's if they're deprived and then zero if not deprived so this is kind of this is similar to the censoring that was done before right you don't count the gap if there's if there if the person is not 
not poor, if they're, if they're over the poor. But there's going to be another level of sensory that we'll do later. So it doesn't end here, OK? So the, these numbers make sense to you? They, they, should I go on? OK. So this one, OK, remember, we're calling it now G1, right? So the um, notation, the matrix of deprivation, so let me just go back. This, which is um, the analog to the head count, we're calling it G0. And then the normalized head a normalized gap, we're calling it G1. Okay, this matrix. Okay. What happens next? This is the squared gap. So so I just kept sort of, you know, it's just an analog to the poverty measures. But like I said, the squared gap we don't really need. So I'm just showing this to you just so you can visualize it, but you won't need it for, for the way. Okay. So now, identification. So this was our matrix of deprivation, right? Now let's introduce what we call a counting vector, C, where we count how many domains are they deprived at or deprived in. What's the right way to say it? In how many domains are they deprived? I think that's the, right. So here two, here four, here one, right? In a unidimensional, you don't need to do that because you only had the one. Right? Since you have multiple dimensions, you have to worry about how many. So in the way you have, let's say, five domains, but actually 10 indicators. So when we're looking at this, we're actually, each row is that we have data for 10 indicators. So it's really 10 dimensions, right? So we're counting in how many dimensions or in how many domains are they, are they deprived. So identification, who is poor? Um, there are different ways, so it's, I mean, what do you think? It's not immediately obvious, right? There are many options. So one possible uh, answer is what, what they're calling the union approach. And what does that mean, union approach? So one first answer is, well, maybe we can count them as poor if they are deprived in any dimension. So that's a very strict definition. So if they're deprived in any so if C is greater than or equal to 1, then they're deprived, right? So if that's the case, then who's deprived? Well, 3. 3 out of 4. 3 okay. out of 4. So, so easily we know that because the, 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 definite, you know, the cutoff is quite strict, the union approach predicts high numbers. Um, this is maybe OK if you only have four dimensions, but what happens if D is large, right? It's a demanding requirement. So um, imagine if you had 10 indicators, or even how, or even more. That, and you require, you know, as long as they're deprived in any of those, then they're poor. So this will identify a very narrow slice of the population. So, so this is this is the. Oh, sorry. I, I okay. High numbers. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, I think this note was supposed to be in the in the previous in the previous slide, but I put it here. So this is the other um, uh, possible answer. Instead of union, we say intersection approach, which means um, they're poor if they are deprived in all the dimensions. So oh, no, this is correct. So it's a demanding requirement, especially if he is large. So it, yeah, OK, so this is what I mean. Here, you only have the one person. So you're requiring them to be deprived in all of the dimensions. This is what I'm thinking. It's so poor for them to be right. So not okay. Enough. Right. Okay. So here, okay. So in the union approach, you only need one. So if you're deprived in one, then you're deprived, right? So your cutoff is is actually very low, right? This is like having, um, you know, I, uh, well, let me not give an example. I'll give an example later, but basically. The bar is very low for mm -hmm. you to be considered to be not poor. So it predicts very high numbers. So the alternative is the opposite. So very being very strict. So actually, you need to be deprived in all oh. before you can be considered to be poor. So in this case, only one person qualifies, right? So if and this is what this is where what I mean when you say it's demanding because if D is large and you need all of them to be 
poor in all of those domains, then it, it identifies very narrow slice of the population. I apologize for the confusion earlier. Um, okay. So the alternative, and this is what the Alcar Foster method does, is what they call a dual cutoff approach. So, which means somewhere in between. So how do you how do you do it? So identifying who is poor, you decide on another cutoff, K, where you identify a person as poor if the count is greater than or equal to K. So you establish a minimum number of dimensions that they have to be poor. Uh, in this case, for example, let's say cutoff is two. So if they're, they, they are deprived in half of the dimensions, two out of the four, then we count them as, as poor. So that would be this person and this person. Person number four, because they're only deprived in one, is still counted as non-poor, right? Because they don't meet the cutoff. And what this is saying is that it includes both the union and the intersection. So remember the result when we use a union approach, what is the result? Um, no, three. All three of them were four. Union. Right. Three, three were four. Three okay. four. And then in the intersection, it's only, only four. One. Okay. And then in the dual cutoff, only these two. Now, when we say it includes both union and intersection, um, what does that mean? So, when K is equal to one, that person is considered poor, right? When k is equal to d, okay, so you can fix k at any point on your. You own. can you can fix k yeah, at any point. Like that's true. subject to then can decide okay we'll fix k at just two, okay? Right. So, but but the thing is, it can be any. Okay, I have an example that okay. might help. That's what means. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. but but see, it's a decision. It's a judgment call, right? Yeah. So here's an example. Uh, pro, um, empirically. Here's an example from India. So poverty in India for 10 dimensions. And if K, this is what happens with the head count when K ranges from union to intersection. So let's see, union, very, very uh, low bar, 91.2% of the population is poor. And if they're using this for targeting, all of them will be targeted for a poverty program. Can you imagine? India is a big country. Uh, now, if you use the opposite, intersection, so in all the domains they have to be poor before they can qualify for the poverty program, nobody qualifies, right? So you need something in the middle. So somewhere, and that's kind of like when you were asking me, why 80% mm -hmm. poverty, you know, in, if we say 100, that's, that's this. Nobody will be uh, empowered. If, if it's one, then it's the reverse. It Everybody. Right? So, so there needs to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. That was identification. Now let's move to aggregation. How do you now construct the in, summarize the information among the population so that we summarize it in an index? So, since, remember, we established K as 2, and these are the people we count as 2. So you will notice that this person is deprived in one dimension, but we're not counting them as poor. So we, we, we need to censor their data, right? So that's, that's that. So this is the censoring that happens in the way of, and this is a source of lots of confusion. Because if you don't understand this, the rationale, it doesn't, it's not in, immediately intuitive why the data needs to be censored. But basically, that's what it's doing. So if this person is not poor, we don't need to worry about what their achievements are in the domain, in the different domain, whatever it is. All we know is that they're, they're over the cutoff. So we don't want to include them. Now, intuitively, the reason is that we only want the information, we only want to summarize the information among the non-poor, right? Because they're the ones we want to target, they're the ones who we want to understand the contribution. So, so for example, if you have a person who is, um, who is 
uneducated, maybe illiterate, but has high income. And then, of course, you know, let's say they're, they're not poor, but they have this one deprivation because actually they're illiterate. But they're, they're making good money. Uh, if we include them in the measure, then you're sort of muddling um, uh, the, the measure because they're actually not, overall, they're not poor, right? So we only want to focus on the poor. So that is sort of, it's a property called focus. You want to focus only the, on the deprived. You want to focus only on the disempowered. Okay. So similarly, for the next matrix, for the normalized gap, we censor the data. So that looks like, wait. Oh, no, I don't have an example. I didn't show it here, but you sh that's what we do, is in the other matrix, you also censor the data. So there will no longer be a gap here. So the censored version means there's no more gap here. And if you look at the notation, there's a slight difference. Whenever we're talking about a censored matrix, I put K inside of there because the censorship is based on the cutoff we've chosen. Right? If, I, if we had chosen a cutoff of four, then you don't, you would have censored both, both um, two and one. Right? If we had chosen a cutoff of one, nobody would be censored. Right? So the censor censoring depends on what K we have chosen. I'm, people are still with me? OK. Because it's getting complicated. Huh? OK, head count. What is the head count now? Remember, there's still, there's still four people. Huh? There's still four people. So it's still 50%. Now, so the head count is now based on this. Yes. OK, so now the problem with the head count. Suppose the number of deprivations rises for person two. And so it's this person. Uh, so right now, the, you know, two was the count. What if it becomes three? It becomes three. Yeah, it's still 50%. Three ones okay. deprived. Yes, but you got to. Why? He's what she, he or she is also. It's still deprived. It's still, yeah, it's not like has Yeah. No, it's correct. No change, right? No change. But, in that, reality. but OK, there is no change in the measure. But is it, it's a problem. It's a problem because somebody has actually become more deprived, yeah. but the measure is not sensitive, mm. right? So that's a problem. Oh, what do we do with it? OK. So, so this, this violation is actually called, uh, this property is called dimensional monotonicity. So it violates that property, and that's a, an important property of a poverty measure. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we cannot just use this. We have to do something else. This extra step where we look at the deprivation shares among the poor, right? So among the poor, and there are, there, there, there are these two people, you have two out of the four domains and four out of the four domains. And why are we doing this? So that if there is a change here, the share will change, right? OK, so what will happen? Um, we define a new measure called A. And this is the average deprivation share among the poor. And the average of these two things is 3 over 4. OK, people are following? despite the, forget about this last row. Uh, and then we now have, instead of just the head count, we call it the adjusted head count ratio. And we call that M0. And if you look at the publications on the WEA, especially the World Development Paper on the Methodology, the Alcatraz, they talk about M0. Uh, in the Multidimensional Poverty Index literature, methodology, they use the M0 uh, as well. So it's this, we're calling it the same because it's the same sort of formula. So when, they, when we say M0, this is, not, this is not just the head count, it's the adjusted head count that takes this part into account. So it's the original head count times the A, the average deprivation share among the pool. So H times A. So this is a formula. So Remember that the original head count is one half. The average deprivation share is three over four. 
So the adjusted headcount is 3 over 8 or 0.375. So the, that's lower than the original headcount, right? So the idea is that imagine there were two countries. And in this country, and, and in both countries, the headcount is half the same, right? But in this country, there was a bigger proportion of domains where people were, dis were deprived. So let's say here everybody was poor. Everybody who fell below the poverty line were deprived in all dimensions. So the score were all fours. And here, their score were all twos. But they're, 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 they both have the same number of poor. So the head count is the same. But when you take into account the average deprivation share, the share of this is higher than the share of that. So the measure will be higher for this population and lower for that population. And that's what we want. We don't want a head count that cannot distinguish between these two populations because we know that even though you have the same number of poor people in both, these people are poorer than the poor of that country. Okay. So now the example, right? What happens when that previous example, the deprivation of person two rises. Mm -hmm. So now it's three. And now the share is three over four. Mm -hmm. What is the new M0? So the, uh, the new average deprivation share among the poor is the average of this. It's mm -hmm. now 7, 8. So? So you multiply by half. Right. Yeah. So the original headcount is still the same. Yeah. But the uh, A is now 7 over 8. So it changes. It now becomes higher. So you now have a higher poverty index oh, no. because somebody had that's more, dis no. more dis yeah. deprivation. Yeah. So that's what the A is for. So remember, the A, it measures shortfall, right? So it tells you the depth, mm -hmm. the depth of poverty, the depth mm -hmm. of the, the disempowerment. So if the depth changes, the measure changes. Mm. So let's say in our same two country example, let's say I did poverty programs here. And people uh, are no longer, because I gave everybody, uh, I don't know, free education. And, and then uh, over time, they are no longer disempowered. In, uh, no, not disempowered. They're no longer poor. They become literate. I teach them how to read. So now they have one less deprivation as before. Uh, they're still poor because there's, they're, instead of four, they're now three. They had lose one. They're still poor, but they should, the M0 will reflect an improvement. It would yeah. follow them because now they're not as far from the cutoff as before. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So this measure, adjusted headcount, M0, satisfies dimensional monotonicity. And that's why we like this one. This is what we use. So M0 is valid for ordinal data. It's robust to monotonic transformations of data. Um, it's very similar to the traditional poverty gap. So if you remember the poverty gap, it's actually headcount times income gap, right? And then this one, M0, is H times A. So we just change it a little bit because it's now multidimensional. So instead of an income gap, you have the average deprivation gap. It's still easy to calculate. It's mm -hmm. still easy to interpret because the intuition is sort of the same. Um, yes? Why did you add an A? Wouldn't you just leave it as M0? Because you cannot have M0 without deciding on what your cutoff is. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to tell us okay. how you're identifying. Without telling us what your K is, so every M0 depends on the K because remember, you're using the head count. So who is poor is the first step. You need to know the head count. And that, the, you need to know what the K is. Is it 3? Is it 4? Is it 2? And for every K, there's a different H. There's a different head count. So the M0 depends on the K, right? Um, 
Now, it can be broken down. This is, this is the best part about the M0, is that it can be broken down by dimension, which is really useful for policy. Because if I know that actually the dimension where everybody, like just go back here, that actually, well, here it's all the same. But suppose we had a dimension that everybody was disempowered or that disempowered was deprived, then I know I should focus on that. And maybe priority, if I can only do one project, I cannot do all projects in all dimensions, I can prioritize this project because I know. So, so it's really useful for policy that way. So this, this measure is, is decomposable by dimension. Um, if dimensions are of intrinsic value, then every deprivation can be interpreted as a shortfall of intrinsic concern. Um, so, yeah, so this is just an interpretation. For, for the multidimensional measure, um, if you think that all of those things are basic needs, then every shortfall is a concern. So here you could look at this and say, okay, every shortfall is a problem, not just the ones where... But the interpretation depends on, um, on why you chose a dimension. Now, and remember, in the unidimensional measure, within the measure, you're assuming that shortfalls for one compensate for the other. So you cannot, you don't value one over the other here because you can see every dimension. If you value all dimensions, you can, you can, you can see people's achievements in all of them, or if you want to prioritize, you can do that as well. So, so both are possible. So it gives you more flexibility. Now, what's, what should be K? So this is a big question, right? And this is maybe every time I present on the way, it's like, why 80%? Um, and it's hard to answer because there are many, you know, uh, it's a judgment call. Uh, so it depends on the purpose of the exercise, the data, and the weights. So as we said, if you're, if you're trying to get at a measure of human rights, you know, like some basic quality of living, should be guaranteed for everybody, then you want to use union. If somebody is deprived in one, that's a problem because they have, that is their right, right? So you use union as your, as your K. Um, if you are uh, using it for targeting, uh, you can target according to categories. So you, look at, you can look at the poorest 5% of the population or uh, based on your budget. Um, we can cover only 18% of the population, who are they? So we can choose the K that will give us the proportion of people who fall or the bottom 18%. Um, if you have bad data, which is common, uh, unreliable data, or if people do not value all dimensions, they're good to have, but not, you know, it's not, you, it's like you can still have a good quality of life even if you're not literate for example, in our previous case, then you can set k less than the dimension. So it's like you can compromise a little bit. So in the way, uh, well, maybe even if a person is overworked, as long as they're having enough income, as long as they have decisions, they're making it conscious, if they're making a, uh, an autonomous decision, then maybe they're still empowered. It's okay. So you don't need to be uh, deprived in all the dimensions to be counted. So it's okay to have the case less than uh, than the di number of dimensions. It doesn't need to be for everything. Um, you know, so some particular combination, so an intersection of the income deprived and deprived in some other dimension is also possible. So you can make one dimension non-negotiable. So let's say uh, education, everybody should be literate. If you're not literate, I don't care what your other things are, this is the cornerstone of your well-being. So you can make this non-negotiable and then everything else. So, so there are many ways to, to decide what the case should be. But as you can tell, there are many things to consider, right? And it varies depending on what the goal is. Okay, now weights. Uh, Bettina was excited about the weights. Okay, now how do you modify for weights? So there are two points where we can use weights. Um, identification. So K can now be 
interpreted as the cutoff of a weighted sum of dimensions instead of just the number of it. So it's a counting vector. Instead of counting how many dimensions, if you weight the dimensions differently, then you're counting the weighted sum of dimensions, right? Okay. Kind of like the way. Mm -hmm. um, in the aggregation, you can simply weight the matrix vector prior to taking the mean. So there are two points. And I think in theory, you could use different weights for this and different weights for that, but it's hard to justify. So it's better to just use the same weights. Um, but I mean, you could think of it as, you know, th there could be other weights here. So for example, if you had sampling weights, you could apply sampling weights here, which is different from weights for, uh, for the dimensions. And in, in actual data, that's what we do. But anyway, so, but this is how it happens. So let's go to an example. So in our original, and here I got it correct, as well, yeah, correct? I, I copied the correct one. <laughs> Matrix of deprivation. So we have, as before, G0, domains and persons. Now we choose the relative weights for each dimension. So for this dimension is 0.5 with 2 here, 1. And the, the, the main thing to remember here is that we want to choose the weights to add up to the number of dimensions, right? As long, you can choose whatever, you can assign the weights, but it has to be assigned such that they sum to four, because we have four dimensions. So it has to sum up to all, whatever dimensions you have. So, so this is, we had applied the weights. Did you, did you notice that? So here, mm -hmm. see, we have the matrix of deprivation. These are zeros and ones, where mm -hmm. the ones are the deprived ones, right? Mm -hmm. So we apply the weight. So basically, we multiply the entire column by the weight. We weight it, right? OK, so how does that look like? Then it looks like this. So now, the, instead of 1, is 0.5. Then it's 2. Then it's 1. OK? OK? Then here's our counting vector. Now you have 2.5, 4, and 2, because now this is weighted more than the others. This is actually the highest weight. You downweight the two ends, and you, you double this weight, and this remains the same. So the count has changed. So identification has changed, because if our k is 2, do I have that? So now the c reflects the weighted sum of dimensions. OK. So remember, because what, if, if we set k to 2, then before, that would have identified as poor only person 2 and person 3. Now, because we had weighted it differently, person 3 is now also not uh, poor. Oh, sorry, person 4 is now also. So remember, at k equals 2, the identification would change. To recover our original identification, we would have to increase the cutoff to 2.5. So if we change the cutoff by two, to 2.5, then we get the original headcount, right? Um, OK. Now we get to censoring. So to aggregate, we censor. So we censor. Now I have it correct, see? Uh, so we censor this uh, person. Um, and then what happens? Yeah, k is now 2.5. When we censor, why don't we make k 2? No, if k was 2, you will not censor this person because this person will be... Okay, okay. okay. yeah, he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. He'll still he'll be deprived. Yes. So we censor the data of, for the non-poor. And then M0 is still the mean of the matrix, which is H times A. So H is still 1 half. And A is now weighted. So A, the weighted A is now 6.5 over A. Did I put the calculation here? But anyway, six. A, so remember, A is the average of, of yes, it's 6.5, right? 2.5 over 4, 4 over 4, mm -hmm. average of those two. Yeah. 
And remember, if I have any typos. <laughs> Okay? We're almost at the end. So a key point here is to distinguish between the deprivation matrix and the censored matrix. So the deprivation matrix is the matrix of deprivations, right? Where you have the zeros and the ones. So this is like, this is the raw data, right? It, 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 you just mark as one those who are falling below the cutoff. And then this is, the, this is their count. The sensor deprivation matrix for k equals 2 sensors, sensors this last row. And now here we, we, we say g over 0 as a function of the k, because the k is how you decide which observations to sense. So, so, the, so this is the Altair Foster method. The dual cutoff approach, the censoring, the M0 is what is the most important thing. So, in terms of decompositions, you can actually decompose by population subgroup the M0. So you can calculate M0 for every population subgroup in your data set. You can calculate a head count. You can calculate the intensity, the average deprivation among the... In the WEA, you will note the... the um, M0 is the empowerment, uh, this, the disempowerment index. And the empowerment index is 1 minus M0, or 1 minus 5D. The head count is a head count, proportion of women who are empowered or proportion of disempowered. Intensity is among the disempowered women. This is the proportion, uh, this is the proportion of domains at which they are empowered or disempowered. Uh, so all of that you can calculate by subgroup. And then post-identification, and what that means is that you have to decide first who's poor, who's not poor. Mm -hmm. You have to decide, for, you have to first identify who is empowered, who is disempowered. Then you can uh, decompose each dimension. Because now, remember, you censored the data of the non-poor. So you cannot go to the non-poor and say, what are their deprivations? No, you put them at zero. You already censored. If you want to look at the achievements of the non-poor, you go to the raw data. Then you can find among the non-poor, this is their education, this is their income. But in the censored matrix, you already censored them. So you will not find any more data there. You set them at zero. So among the people remaining, the non-poor or the deprived, then you can see, OK, which dimension is contributing the most? What are the proportions? And this is what in the, um, in, uh, the report, these, this is what these pie charts are, and these bar charts are. It's the distribution of the indicators, how it contributes to the total index. So you can disaggregate. Um, so you can disaggregate the censored headcount. So among the disempowered, how many of them are deprived in the first dimension, in health, in education? So you decompose by dimension. Among the deprived, what is the proportion of, of the deprivation in this dimension compared to their overall score. And all of this draw on the censored matrix. And I highlight it here because they highlighted it in their presentation. And in my experience, it is true that this is the often misunderstood part of is the censoring. It's like, why do you need to censor? And what is the need for that step? But the problem is sometimes, because people don't understand that step, they skip it. And then it's, it's wrong. Right? Because then you don't get the correct index. Mm -hmm. that's responsive mm -hmm. Right, that's responsive to those changes. Remember? Because what happens if you don't censor, then you get just a traditional head count and there are problems with that because it doesn't satisfy some good properties. Okay? Glossary of terms. Deprivation means the achievement is less than the cutoff. You're poor if the number of dimensions or the proportion weighted average of the dimensions at which the person is poor is less than the cutoff chosen. The deprivation cutoffs are disease, right? So the poverty cutoff, so here there's a difference now because it's multidimensional. The deprivation cutoff is the cutoff for every dimension. It's the vector. The poverty cutoff is the K. Right? The overall. Yeah, so in, in the Alcar Foster methodology, what we're calling a dimension is a column in the matrix. 
that has its own deprivation cutoff. So often this is called, a, this is what we're calling, in practice is what we call an indicator. So if you have 10 indicators, then that's what we mean by a dimension. It's a column in your matrix. Um, and the joint distribution is that entire matrix that shows the simultaneous or coupled deprivations a person or household has. The analog for the for WEA, okay, right? Instead of deprivation, we're calling it inadequacy. Same definition. If the person falls below the cutoff, we say they have inadequate achievement in ownership, inadequate achievement in input in productive decisions, inadequate achievement in group membership. Um, so instead of a, of a poverty cutoff, we have this empowerment cutoff or empowerment cutoff. So empowerment cutoff is is eighty percent. Mm -hmm. What is the disempowerment cutoff? Twenty. And in your do file, you will find that the output comes from the ch censored headcount underscore twenty, which is the cutoff is twenty. These are our domains or dimensions. So in the data, what we care about are the indicators. Okay? And the indicators have different weights. Um, who is empowered? 80%. So this is who is disempowered is 20. Okay? Uh, okay, so this is just a um, review on the methodology. So 5DE uh, uses Elkar Foster method. It, ha it uses information on the incidence of empowerment. This is your head count, sensor head count, the percentage of women who are empowered. And then it uses the information on adequacy among the disempowered, the weighted share of indicators in which disempowered women enjoy adequate achievements. So that is our, our A. So it's based on each woman's empowerment profile, right? So uh, each person has a set of achievements, and we use all of that information to construct. We aggregate it. So we identify first who is empowered, and then we aggregate it all into the 5D. Um, it tells us how women are disempowered. And what that means is that we know which dimensions or which indicators uh, where they do not have adequate achievement, right? It has rigorous properties, and we talked about one, which is dimensional monotonicity, but there are many other proper, desirable properties of poverty indices that it does satisfy. All the proofs are in the journal articles. I won't go into them here. Um, okay, so gender parity index reflects two things. Percentage of women who enjoy gender parity, so this is like a headcount. Right? How many of these household in how many of these households do we have women who have gender parity? And remember that we define having gender parity as either being empowered. So if their score is already 80% or more, they're empowered. So we already assume, regardless of what the man's score is, we already assume they enjoy gender parity. Or if her empowerment score is equal to or greater than the empowerment score of the primary male in their household. So if she is not empowered, so her score is below 80, but her score is the same as her husband or the other male in the household, then she enjoys parity. She has, she has par, her score is, this, is equal to the other, to the male. But this, so it's either her score is point, is high, high enough to be called empowered, or her score is high enough to be equal to the male. Okay, then it also uses empowerment gap. So this is like, you know, H times A. So this identifies who has parity. This identifies among those who don't have parity, how far are they? Where, what is the gap? So we call this the empowerment gap. This is the average percentage shortfall that a woman without parity experiences relative to the male in the household. And again, the reason why this is included in the measure, so that if uh, two households, both of them have, so let's say we have two households, both women don't have, are not empowered, but in one household, she has only, uh, the difference between her score and her husband's score is only 10%, but in this other household, it's 50%. We want the measure to show that this, 
ga the, the GPI for this household is higher, right? So that's the reason. Formulas. So 5DE is 1 minus M0. Yeah. So when there is no male, then, so they're included in 5DE because the 5DE only uses women's scores. In the GPI, only dual adult households are included. So the GPI requires data for households that have both male and female respondents. Um, that's why the GPI has a lower weight, because it's a smaller sample. Uh, it doesn't include all the households. 5DE includes all the households, both dual-headed households or dual adult households and female-headed households, because all you need here, you need here only the women's scores. Uh, so 5DE, so there's a 5DE for the women, and there's a 5DE for the men. So all the men's scores, it, you know, you get a 5DE for the men. So if you, the assumption for the GPI is if you are in a couple household and the woman has a high score, she must have parity. But if there is no male, we don't know if she is empowered because she's empowered by default, if it's a de jure household or de facto household. And there is, I think, some variation in country experiences around whether female-headed households are actually good, you know, being a female-headed household is actually good because they tend to have more resources or are, tend to be poorer in some context. So I think if you're comparing it across countries, that, that assumption is, is, is questionable. But you could, I mean, if you wanted to include it, the way I would do it is you impute a male score. So that when you calculate the GPI, it includes it as if it was a couple household. We have a lot of observations sometimes. You have a real couple household. You have both respondents, but they drop out of this calculation. Why? If they have missing data for any indicator, they drop out. You lose them. You, you, you lose them here in 5DE, you lose them in GPI. Why? Think of the matrix. If you have missing data for one of them, what's, in, what's your counting vector? You cannot have a counting vector. You cannot identify who is poor, who is non-poor. And therefore, you cannot construct a head count. You cannot construct the A. You cannot construct the M. You cannot construct anything. Which is why when they decide, for example, to drop one indicator, we tell them you cannot calculate an index because you cannot identify. So instead, what you can do, it doesn't mean you can't analyze, right? You could still, you know, like for the interim surveys for the Feed the Future, if the mission decides we're not going to collect all the indicators, we're just going to selectively track some indicators we care about, which is fine, but know that you cannot uh, do censoring because how can you censor when you have missing data? Instead, what you should do is to just analyze your raw data and analyze the trends in your raw data for the interim and compare that to the raw data in your baseline. But do not compare your raw data with the sensor because it's different. So when, when, so often this is what happens. Um, you have a couple household, that you have a female response for all the indicators, and then you have a male response for all the indicators except, say, autonomy because they say, not, you know, they didn't want to respond and they have no answers. That person, that household in the data looks like a female-only household because there's no male data. And so they also drop out of GPI. So households drop out of GPI for two reasons. Either they're really female-headed or they have missing data for either one or the other. Because you could also have missing data for females and and complete data for the males, they will also drop out. Okay, so remember the formulas, right? Well, I'll show the formula again. So this is 5DE. So it's 1 minus M0, or if you do a lot of algebra, you can, you can have an equivalent expression where, oh, sorry, where HE, actually, let me go back here, where HE is the head count for the empowered, right? The percentage of empowered mm -hmm. women or men, because you can also do 5DE for men. HD is the percentage of disempowered, so this is just 1 minus HE. Mm -hmm. So these are two sides of the same coin. And then AE 
is the average absolute empowerment score among the disempowered. Okay, that's a handful, a uh, mouthful. So remember that A, A is always calculated among the disempowered. All right, whether it's AE or AD, whatever A, you cannot have an A for the empowered. A is always, because we censor, A is always for the subset of of individuals or how, of individuals that are disempowered. So the only difference is that if it's E, it's absolute empowerment score among the disempowered. So this is the number of dimensions where they have adequacy, where they have achievement. If it's the reverse, D, it is the average. It is like in our count in our matrix example where we're counting the average uh, dimension, the number of dimensions where they have disempowerment or where they have inadequacy. So that is 1 minus AE. So those are also two sides of the same coin. So let me go to the example because then this gives you, there you go. So in Uganda, and this is in the, in the pilot one, we have HE is your percentage of empowered women, 43.3%. So HD is 56 times, see 56.7, which is just one minus that, right? A is the disempowered women still have adequate achievements in 62% of the domain. So this is reflecting how far is their empowerment score from the 80, which is our empowerment cutoff. That is AE. So they still have, so remember, it's all in the positive. Women still have adequate achievement in 62% of the domains. Whereas AD, A sub D, is disempowered women have inadequate achievements in 37.2 of the domains, which is 1 minus A. So these are all, right? So, okay, exercise. What is the 5DE for women? So using the formula, so you know what is M0? H times A, right? So M0, but remember, the M0 is in the negative, in the de de deprived, right? Head count times A for the deprived. So it's either 1 minus the HD and AD, or it's this formula where you have HE, the percentage of empowered women, plus the percentage of disempowered disempowered women HD times their average uh, number of domains where they have or proportion of domains where they have inadequate achievements. So now the reason I have the yeah, two yeah, because yeah, yeah. actually the simpler way to calculate is to use M zero. Mm -hmm. The reason we have to go through all of this is because we want to present it in in empowerment terms. So we put how many are empowered, H-E, plus among the rest of the people who are not empowered, in how many dimensions are they still empowered? That's, that's this. Oh, no, no. H-E, A-E. So that's this. They still have adequate achievements in this proportion of the domain. So we're tr this, you know, this formula is reflecting the empowerment part. So for GPI, I think we just... This is simpler. There's, there is an equivalent version um, where it's in terms of parity in the positive, but the one the version I found has a typo, so I'd rather not give you the wrong formula. This is the more, the correct form. Uh, but there is also an equivalent version of this, and it should be maybe it's in the it's in the Alcar in the World Development Paper, Sabina's paper. So percentage of households without Gender parity is 45.6. Oh, no, I, this is wrong. Um, that should be IG. Yeah, I should change this thing. But basic, basically, you, you know, if you flip it, no, this should be, this is not HGPI. What we mean here is that, oh, no, this is without. This should be the negative. Without gender parity. Sorry, um, I should change this. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is, should be, and then this is the one minus. So th don't use this. Use this one. And then the IGPI is the average empowerment gap between women and men living in households that lack gender parity. 
So among the households without gender parity, this is how far the women's scores are from the men. So this is 1 minus this times this. Okay? And then in the report, we have percent of women achieving parity and a percent of women not achieving parity. So they always report both because they don't, I don't know, we don't trust people to do the 1 minus. So we tell them, we do it for you, no, so that you can immediately look if you're looking at disempowerment or empowerment. But they sum to 100. OK? Yeah. It's a weighted average. Right. And then add that to this. 0 0.7999. OK, close enough. Rounding error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, in your in your uh, state output, this will be like I don't know a six-digit decimal, right? It'll be very precise. Here we just round it off to one decimal. Okay. Okay, so the AEI is also not So this is it. The we're all fine now. Where? Yes. Okay. So this sum to hundred. This sum to a hundred. Mm. Yeah, this, yeah. Okay. So. yeah, so, you know, if you're close enough to this, then you got it right. Okay, so did you get 80? Yeah, I did. Yes. Mine was 0.9999. 0.7999. Yeah, yeah, that's approximately 8. That's just rounding error. Okay.